One thing I wanted to, to say uh, last time before we quit, and I, didn't, I just didn't get to it. This is something that's um, helped me, and I'll read this statement. River crossers, so people that are making these great crossings, river crossers don't let the river decide who they will be or where they will be. God does. So if you want to be a great river crosser, you want to make a great crossing with the Lord, you can't let the river decide who you're going to be or where you're going to be to make a great crossing for God. So <clears throat> we'll keep those thoughts going uh, uh, throughout the week. Um, but what we're going to do for the next uh, two 50-minute teaching sessions is we'll have more, there'll be more of teaching sessions. I'm going to share some of the highlights from some of my uh, work in the book and then some additions to that. And then we're going to really hone in on um, looking at how you, the elements of creating a great vision. We'll do that in hour two, and we'll look at a case study from Jacob's dream on the ACU campus. So if there aren't any other, and, oh, I was going to share this one thing. That's why the phone's up here. Let me just say um, there are a lot of blessings that God gives you. One for me uh, has been to be married and uh, to have a partner who just, just light it, lights up my life. 37 and a half years, and who we didn't think the Lord would give us any biological children. There's a whole story to that, but we have three beautiful girls. And uh, what I'm learning as I mature um, is that they're becoming the wind under my wings. So I get texts like this all the time, but this came from our baby this morning, and she says, this is the week, exclamation point. The tradition you started years ago, God has only continued to bless more and more. And then she says a lot of sweet daddy stuff. And then she says, I'm praying God shows up in big ways this week on the mountain, and Satan is silenced. I love you, wish you so much I could be there, get mad. And in our family, getting mad was always make a difference. So before they'd go to school, I'd say, get mad. And I'd say, okay, Dad, yeah, we got it. Um, so we do that. So... Um, with that wind under my wings, let's have a prayer, and then we'll start our teaching session. Father, thank you for the beautiful snow. Thank you for the beauty uh, that your son has brought to us. Uh, just open our minds and our hearts and help us to have a great teaching session uh, this next hour. I pray in Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So the title of, of this session is, is uh, Building a Brand That Matters. And uh, before we jump into that, I want to show you... Uh, maybe I'm going the wrong way. That's it. Let me give you a real quick of my, a glimpse of my family since I don't teach on campus uh, like I used to. This is my 91-year-old mom that I referred to. Uh, there's a lot of stories about her. She's uh, struggling right now, but she's been an awesome mom. Uh, Jeannie, I mentioned, uh, 37 and a half years. She's just the love of my life. She's allowed me to be much more than I could have been on my own. Uh, and then... Most of my life has been about girls. Uh, we have three daughters. These are pictures of them when they were younger, 2006, 2011. Um, this was in 2015, and uh, when, when Kelly worked at Walmart, we were up in Bentonville. Uh, this was over the Christmas holiday, and you'll see a little guy there in the middle that's an addition. Um, we've had several additions that have been on the male side, but the first couple of additions were on the female side, and so to the left, I think to your left, that's Kelly's dog, a golden doodle, Daisy, in the scale, female. Uh, she's incredible. She's wild. She's so much fun. She's incredible. And then, a couple years ago, I decided I was going to be a rancher because uh, I'm from Detroit, and I have two brothers back there, and I just said, look, I'm a rancher, man. And they're like, get out of here. You don't know anything about cows. So we uh, went to auction. For Kelly's uh, birthday on January 13th, we went to the Abilene Auction in Abilene, Texas. It's about three miles from campus. I lived there 27 years, taught for, and didn't even know it was there. Auctioned off with all these farmers and cattle ranchers, and we bought uh, Butter and Bell, and they're mama cows. And uh, we've had, I think, four or five calves uh, since then. And then Hayden, uh, the guy on the right, uh, was our first male addition. Uh, Hayden and Michelle, after they graduated ACU, got married. And uh, they went to school in Houston. And then another male addition, this guy's awesome. I always heard grandfathers say that. And I was like, 
put your pictures away, whatever. I love my children, you know. <laughs> He's awesome. So it's a boy. Um, now, Tim pointed this out. If you know anything about the Denver Broncos, there's a famous guy in the stands all the time. Anybody know about this guy? He's called the Barrel Man, and he, all he wears, no matter what the temperature in Denver is at mile high, like an oak barrel that ages whiskey or beer, what, you know, that's a, and it's painted orange, and he's got two sus suspenders on each side that hold it up, and then he's just got shoes on, and that's all he's got, and he's painted hair and everything. And so Tim looked at that picture and said, this is the future Barrel Man. I mean, Tatum is going to be the guy, so I added the, the Broncos deal to it. Um, and then last couple slides, grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I love water and why the Lord sent me to Abilene, Texas for my career. We'll just have to talk about that in heaven. Um, those are pictures from Mackinac Island, which is a beautiful island up in the Great Lakes, just north of the mainland of northern Michigan. We go every summer, and I just I really love it. And then uh, the last thing I'd say to you is... Um, I don't know why, all of my life, I've liked to go fast. And we grew up in Detroit, so I had engines all the time. If, if you gave me a lawnmower engine, I'd figure out how to rev it up, ride it faster than any of the other dads mowing in the neighborhood, make motorcycles out of it, race cars. Um, this is some boat racing up in the, in the Great Lakes. And then my, uh, my story about um, speed is uh, I have, I worked for Volkswagen for a couple years, and... Um, I shouldn't have done this, but I confess every year. I had a Volkswagen Passat. It was a very nice vehicle. And if you know where 8384 is going by Abilene Regional, do you know where south of town, Abilene Regional's down there past the mall in Abilene? You go down. It was kind of a long stretch of road, and uh, I hit 145 one day. Now, I'm kind of not proud of it. I mean, kind of. It was fun because nobody got hurt. But I think I could have got it to maybe 150, 160, but... Jeannie's picture came to my mind, and then honestly, just people that might be hurt in the process. And so that's the last time I've really ever done something like that, and that was probably 15 years ago. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit about me. I'm uh, just delighted to be here with you. So let's, let's, uh, let's open up our books, our minds, and start teaching. So you know, at Summit, we use the Kusis and Posner definition of leadership, which is the art of mobilizing others to want to struggle to achieve shared aspirations, right? So it's an art, as Dennis has talked about. It's not a science, it's something that's, that's fluid, that's creative, that can be innovative based on who you are. But let me tell you, leadership is about leading people, not products. Leadership is all about influence and all about people. Whether you're in a classroom, whether you're in your family, whether you're in a social club on campus, whether you're at Sing Song, whatever it is that you're doing, Leadership is all about people. So you're mobilizing others. This is why that Great Shepherd passage is so powerful to me. It's this notion, the metaphor of bringing people somewhere they've never been before. Um, if you're afraid of the word, the word influence or power, I just think I'm challenging you to think through that. Because if Jesus was not powerful and influential, we wouldn't be here today and we wouldn't have a shot at salvation. Leadership is all about influence in the best way that influence can be defined. To achieve these shared aspirations. And so today, we'll talk about vision and what we see in leadership. And so as we go through a couple of highlights from the book, um, I hope you'll begin to just, again, help look at what's going on in your life and how you can be a person that goes from here to there with God. So most of you know the four Ps from the business schools. I'm hoping, Dr. Crisp, um, that we can come up with the four P's that we teach you from a business standpoint. Anybody want to shout the first one? You're killing me. Product is one. Place. Price. Promotion. Good. Those are the four P's, right? We say, now there are additional three P's that a lot of people have added in the literature, but we say that's how you create your value proposition. You can change your product. You can add benefits. You can take benefits away. You can change your price up, down, parity price. That creates value for the customer. You talk about it, you communicate it, right, in your promotion, and then location, location, location is so important, whether that be clicks or bricks. Those are the four Ps. So what I've tried to, to do is to say, hey, there's four Ps to building your own brand of leadership, regardless of who you are, what your talents are, what you want to do with your life, wherever God's called you. And so that's, 
the premise of the book is to use those to not be ordinary, but to be something different. So what I would say to you, and I try to say in the book, is I really believe, and I believe this from a biblical perspective, and I believe it from the way I see it played out. Generic is generally powerless. If you look at anything in the marketplace, and it's kind of common, it's kind of average, it's kind of ordinary, it doesn't possess any power to influence people from a consumer standpoint to make a choice to choose them, but from an eternal standpoint to influence anybody for anything that really matters, right? Moses knew this very, very clearly. In Exodus thirty-three sixteen. Moses, if you remember, Moses is the guy that God chose. And by the way, God did not choose a committee to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Everybody clear on that? He didn't choose a committee. And there's reasons for that, and there's reasons to use committees. But he, he needed this done. He communicated to Moses, and Moses assembled, mobilized the people so that they would want to actually do something that they were afraid to do. So he's done all that. He's seen all the plagues in Egypt. He has witnessed the parting of the Red Sea. He sees the deliverance of God's people across the Red Sea. And he comes to a point in his life where he goes up on the mountain with God to receive, right, um, these Ten Commandments for the people. And while he's gone, he comes down the mountain. Do you remember what happens? He starts hearing singing and dancing and kind of partying and revelry. And he gets so frustrated that he breaks the Ten Commandments Blah, 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 blah. Well, this is later in his life. He goes back up on the mountain to be with God. And he says in Exodus 33, 16, Lord, you have asked me to lead these people. True statement? Yes. Moses, have you not been leading? Yes. You've asked me to lead these people. How will anyone know we are distinctive from among all the other people on the face of the earth? without your presence. What will make me distinctive is exactly what, asked, what Moses asked him. I don't want to be generic. I need something to get these people to follow. And God says to Moses, because you're faithful and because I have found favor with you, I will grant you your request. And he takes Moses and he puts him behind a cleft in this rock and God reveals all of his glory to him and Moses is changed forever. I never read in Scripture again that Moses is griping, complaining, whining, questioning his leadership assignment because the very presence of God changed Moses. But here's the point I want you to hear. I believe this with all of my heart. God did not create you to be common, ordinary, generic. I don't mean you have to be on the front of the Wall Street Journal. I'm talking about you just need to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He's the one that makes you distinctively different so that you can influence what really matters. The farther you move away, guys, from generic, the more powerful you become in your leadership for that which really matters. So this is out of a, you know, a typical business textbook in marketing, but basically, if you look at the list, you're going to see that great brands are on the right side of this. They have a distinct set of promises, they're highly valuable, they have an emotional connection with people, they're managed very, very well. I'm going to submit to you today that that's the same thing that should be happening in your own life as a leader, as a follower of Christ. Benjamin Netanyahu said it this way. I don't know if it's in the book. I think it is. But I happened to be on a phone call with him. He's today the Prime Minister of Israel. Benjamin Netanyahu, to a group of eight of us on the phone, said, Gentlemen, he said, the fundamental es essence of leadership is to fight for an idea. Fight for an idea that you believe in. And if you follow world politics at all, who's fighting for the nation of Israel? The prime minister is giving his life fighting for the nation of Israel not to be wiped off the face of the earth. He's so passionate about it. Dr. Noel Tishy would say it this way at the University of Michigan. Every great leader has a teachable point of view. A teachable point of view, TPOV. Horst Schultze has a teachable point of view. He was on campus. Any of you get to hear Horst when he was on campus? Is phenomenal? Passionate? He was the one that created this idea at the Ritz-Carlton. He founded the Ritz-Carlton. He was, he was the founder of the Ritz-Carlton brand. And he was the one that came up with the idea of ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. That's what we are. Do you, do you see that perspective? Versus, well, it's a job, right? We are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. And he was the one that helped 
true at Kathy come up with this notion of when you go through the Chick-fil-A window and everybody knows what they say, they say, my pleasure. That was from Horst Schultze. Horst has this vision of customer service about what it means to be a man of God in the service industry, and, and he's brought that. A great story I love about Ferdinand Porsche. Again, Porsche was known, he was, he was the inventor of, anybody remember? Well, Porsche, yes. <laughs> the Beetle. Adolf Hitler came to Dr. Ferdinand Porsche and said, I need a people's car. I need a functional car, no bells and whistles, that will be affordable, that will be functional, and will be stable forever. And so he went to Porsche, and Porsche designed the Beetle. The story is told of Porsche, he's out in a construction yard one day, and he's, uh, it, was, it, was, it, was a, it was a large construction yard, and he had a series of meetings, but he went out in the morning, and he met a guy and said, hi, I'm Ferdinand Porsche, what's your name? And the guy said, my name's so-and-so, and he says, what do you do? And the guy says, I'm a bricklayer. And he says, well, it's great to meet you. Goes back to me. He comes out, does it again. Hey, hey, what's your name? I'm so-and-so. What do you do? I'm a general laborer. I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm tired. Yeah, great. Nice to meet you. What, what, have a nice day. He comes back out at the end of the day. He noticed in both of the first two meetings, in the corner of his eye, he saw this guy that seemed to have a spring in his step doing his work. You with me? You ever see that guy, that person that's there humming? And he goes out and he meets him. Hi, I'm Dr. Ferdinand Porus. What's your name? He tells him. He says, what do you do? And he says, I build cathedrals. He had the same job as the other guys. Sir Christopher Wren, Sir Christopher Wren helped build St. Paul's Cathedral in London. He did a lot of other great works. He was a master artist. And when he was 90 years old, 90, they put him every morning, he came to work in the cathedral every morning, and they put him in a basket, a wicker basket, and the guys hoisted him up to the top of the vault, I don't know, some hundreds of feet above the uh, floor, and he just kept working and working, and he was in bad health, and he, he had to finish this mural. And one day, some passers-by said, Sir Christopher Wren, why do you work so hard for something that nobody will see? And he said, God will see. That's where we get that, that notion of in excelsis Deo, to the glory of God. We do this, we live this, we work this way to the glory of God. Perspective matters, and it's going to define who you are. So you guys mentioned some of these folks. Let's just throw them all up there. Anybody know who's in the middle, top middle? Anybody know that face? Sam Walton, Walmart. What's their tagline? You guys. Save money, live better. Save money, live better. That's their vision, and they've lived it out all these years. Um, You've got Elon Musk down below. You've got, who's, who's the bald-headed guy next to Sam Walton? Jeff Bezos, Amazon, taking over the retail world. Zuckerberg to the left, Adolf Hitler. All of these people have ideas. They have perspectives about why they're alive and what they're doing. History will say whether they're good or bad. We know that Adolf's was bad, and uh, there's question marks in some of these other guys. So let me do two, two shots from this. Um, I won't go through all of it, but one, one of my favorite stories is uh, by a guy named um, Horace Williams. He was a professor at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. This was back in the time when it was just guys in class. He came in one spring morning, the magnolias were blooming, and he walks in the room and he says, gentlemen, question for the day. What's the most important part of an ox cart? Of course, like you guys typically do when Professor Esco. You know, everybody's looking down. Smith? Mm, the wheel, sir? Wrong. Nelson? The oxen? Wrong. And he proceeded to go through everybody, and of course everybody's wrong, which is why nobody wants to look up at the professor. And it's said that he turns from the window, and he looks at the, at the class, and he says, Gentlemen, the most important part of an ox cart is the blueprint. Once the blueprint is established, any jack leg can do the rest, end of quote. The beauty is in the design. It's in your perspective. If you can see it, you can become it. What is it that you see? And then back to Jesus in Matthew 6. What do your eyes see? Are your eyes good? Are they full of light? What are you looking at? Perspective is so important. The second P is position. Um, the lead line here for me 
is I had, the, again, the privilege of being with this General Wayne Downing at University of Michigan at an executive ed course they had. And there were a lot of speakers, and we went through a lot of things, but I noticed one day, I, had, I put on my bucket list after I heard him speak, I want to go have lunch with that guy. And so for some reason, it happened that he was in line. I jumped in line behind him, started a conversation, asked if I could have lunch with him, sat down with General Downing. General Downing was a four-star general in the U.S. Army, and he was in charge of strategic special forces for the world, for the United States. And I'm like, okay, what do I ask this guy? I said, General, if I might, what one thing would you tell me is the most important thing you've learned about leadership? And he said, when in charge, take charge. When you're a student, be a student. Take charge of that investment. You become a dad, be a dad. Don't be what the world tells you a dad's supposed to be. Be a dad, be a man, be a woman. When you've been given something to take care of, take charge. That's essential to leadership, and that's exactly what Jesus did. Mark Twain kind of said it this way. Um, if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know one thing's for certain. Somebody put him there. But when I first said this, when I came to Abilene, Texas, I was, in a, I was teaching in the, just something for the community, and there was a farmer in the back of the room with overalls, you know, overalls on. He goes, could have been a flood. I said, yeah, it could have been a flood, and that's how he got up there. But basically, the, the notion is, if you think through it, like I, I try to write about, every position that you have has been given to you. It's been gifted to you. You didn't have anything to choose about your birth. You know, I, I, how did I become a husband? Jeannie gave me that opportunity. It was a gift. Use the position that God's given you. Jesus did it very well, as you know, in all these things. He took control. Look at what he did. He said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. He didn't say, oh, power, I don't know. Influence, I don't know, God. I don't know. He said, look, I know who I am. And he said, actually, in John, I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. And I'm here to do the will of my Father. And so I'm going to use his power to get it done. So the essence of leadership, you guys, is what will you do with the positions that God is giving you? I've never said once in the book, I don't believe it in my heart. It, I'm not saying climb to the top. I'm saying to you, and I think God is saying, whatever he's given you, take it and use it to bless mankind and to bring glory to God. That's the essence of that. When I talk to CEOs that I have a, a privilege to turn around with, um, it's amazing. I've interviewed about 75 of them across the United States. They're Christian CEOs. And almost everyone, unsolicited, said, I will never hire someone who aspires to be a CEO. Now, why do you think they made that statement? This is where you... Seriously, why would you think... I, I didn't ask that, but it came up all the time. Why do you think they said that? I'm going to wait you out on this one. Okay, if you want to do it, just do it. I think that's a true statement. What else? Yes, sir. Absolutely. And ma'am? Awesome. Be a follower before you accept leadership. The people that aspire just to be president so they can prove they can be president are typically too self-centered to really be a great leader. And most CEOs don't want any, anything to do so. So what they're saying is do a great job where you're at. I told my 28 daughter, 28 daughters, my 28-year-old daughter, she had a little bit of a rough experience at Walmart after her MBA. She comes to American Airlines. She's there nine months. They have no manager. They're going through a corporate changeover. And if you're in a big corporation, this is always. We're restructuring. We're reorganizing. We're revisioning. Re, 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 re. So she's without a boss for nine months, and people are leaving, and they're coming up to Kelly, and they're saying, Kelly, there's no future here. You need to leave. And she came to me, and she said, Dad, what do you think? And this is over months, and I just said, Kelly, here's what I think. I think everybody's going to bail. And I said, I think if you work hard, 
You add value, you volunteer for everything that's possible to volunteer for, and you, and you just show them your talent. I just think God's going to bless that. I don't know what bless means. And she did that, and a couple of months ago, she got promoted two levels above herself, and now she's in charge of all premier services for American Airlines for the United States. It's like, and she came back to me, and she goes, I know, Dad, what you're going to say. <laughs> Take the position as student, as friend, as son or daughter, boyfriend, girlfriend. Take it and do something with it. I'm going to go through that. Let's talk about P number three, power. And let me, let me ask you this. Let's do it a little bit more interactive. So why is it that power seemingly just gives us so much angst? Do, do you have power? Where's Colton Powell? Do you have power? You don't? Yeah, I know. That's, that's like uh, Dr. Williams. Uh, wrong. Do each of you have power to influence? Yes, you do. God said, my spirit is not a spirit of fear. My spirit is a spirit of power, of influence. To, why would God ask you to convert the world to him and not give you the power to do it? You have power. Power is not bad. In fact, I like power when it's 110 in Dallas and I can get my air temperature up to about 75 inside the house. I'm really grateful for power. And I'm grateful that Jesus has power and that he exercises it well with the wisdom of God. But we seem to struggle with it. And that slide before that I went by, I remember I brought Carlos Sepulveda in to do one of our September summits on campus, the lectureships on campus that happen at ACU every year. And Carlos came and spoke, and he was one of the first business sort of guys that we keynoted as a campus. I'll never forget this question. Somebody said, Carlos, you're CEO of Interstate. And Carlos is going to be here uh, teaching for us uh, Wednesday. He said, you're CEO of Interstate Batteries. How can you be a Christian? Different perspective. If you've ever met Carlos Sepulveda, this guy's having Bible studies every week for 25 years with young men and women in his office, changing people for Christ, sponsoring work all over the world. The guy's incredible. If you've got a position, God's given you the power to do something with that position. Last thing I would like to talk to you about is this notion of um, the power of his presence and him taking up residence in you, but then also the power of your presence as a leader uh, in the lives of other people. We go back to Moses. Um, if you remember, I said Moses asked God to make him distinctive and to make the people of Israel distinctive among all nations. And God's answer was, I will give you my presence. In fact, Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us from here. The most powerful thing in your life that you have access to is the very presence and power. Paul, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, is he's reflecting back on this moment where Moses goes up into the mountain and he's exposed to the presence of God, which, again, is syrupy. It's hard for us. It's mysterious for us to find. He, he reflects on that, and he said, and we, we, all who with unveiled faces, all reflect the glory of the Lord because the veil's been torn away. Christ has torn away this veil between God and us. And do you remember what was happening to Moses when he came off the mountain? Do you remember what, what he looked like? Do you remember anything? He was glowing. 
and I, I have, and we're not doing it today, but I have glow men that I collected years ago from like Burger King and McDonald's. Well, if you put a glow man in the light, he can glow or she can glow. There's no power in the glow man. So Colton, there's no power in the glow man. The power's in the light. And when that glow man moves away from the light, he still shines in the darkness for a while, but eventually he loses his glow because he hasn't spent time in the presence of the light. And as a leader, as a young Christian, as a young Christ follower today, you are so busy and our society is so rushed that it's hard for you to even think about every day starting your day with time before the Lord. Now, here's where I think the power comes from, sort of from a spiritual physics standpoint. This is my way of thinking about it. I think you become like that which you love, okay? You might could write that down. You don't have to. I think it's important. You become just exactly like that which you love. Martin Luther said it this way. Your treasure in which your heart delights and in whom you trust is your God. You know, who you rely on, who your soul relies on, and and, and in whom you trust is your God. Jesus said it this way. Wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But if you fall in love with yourself, you fall in love with the trappings of this world, you'll become just like it. You'll become nothing more than yourself. And I'm going to make a political statement. I think our current president is in love with himself. And he is so much less the person he could possibly be as a leader because he doesn't have this, in my opinion. I'm giving you one man's opinion. But I thought about it this way even for my own self as a young guy. When I was about 15, I fell in love with motocross racing. I don't know if you know what that is, but it's guys on motorcycle engine, guys on motorcycles, spitting up dirt everywhere, jumping. I would ride. I tried to cross little rivers in Michigan. I tried to build jumps on my motorcycle. Never made it. Always into the river. A lot of stories about that. But what happened is I fell in love with this. It just became my passion, and so I spent time on it. And if you'd have looked at me at 14 years old, I just like a kind of a normal 14-year-old, and then if you'd have looked at me when I was about 17, I was a totally different person. I didn't set out to become a different person. It's because what I was exposed to, I had a jersey from Yamaha. I had rubber pants. They looked like leather. You know, I had the rubber thing. had rubber fake gloves. had a helmet. had a shield. had a face protector. I was literally transformed by that which I fell in love with. And then later on, this beautiful five foot two blonde came into my life and the things that I never had time to do I just seemed to have all the time in the world to spend time with her I dated her five years I begged her to marry me for about two and a half of those five years in small group ask her this would be a great one for you to ask I mean I fell in love with her and all of a sudden I had time for her and all of a sudden the residence that she took up in my life began to change me And now I've become one with her. And what I'm saying to you is, what you set your heart on, what you fall in love with, the presence that you get gives you the power. And of course, I'm talking spiritually about Jesus. He will give you the power to lead in whatever capacity he's called you to lead in. You've heard the old saying, he doesn't call the equipped, he equips the the called. So fall in love with Jesus. Um. And look at the power statements that Jesus makes. Let's just end on these. In Romans 1.4, the Bible says Jesus was declared with power to be the Son of God. In Luke 4, he overcame Satan by the power of the Holy Spirit. Luke 6, so much power came out from him that people tried to touch him. In fact, in Mark 6.56, it says that Jesus, when he went into the villages and into the towns and in the marketplaces, people were coming up to him just to touch him because power was coming out from him. Healing power. This presence about him. People wanted to be around that. And then Ephesians says we've been given that power in Christ. So three Ps to think about as you work through this week and as you work through your life. What do you see? And actually the way you behave is a reflection of how you see God. So basically I can look at you 
and you can look at me, and you ought, to be tell, you ought to be able to tell me what I believe about my God in heaven. In fact, to Peter, do you remember Jesus asked a question, who do people say that I am? And I said, well, some people say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, one of the prophets. But Jesus said to Peter, who do you say that I am? And what I would say for you today is, what that means to me is, who do you say he is? You see, the Christ, the Son of the living, what's your perspective on your life and what he can do? Two, whatever position he's given you, be a Matthew talent, parable of the talents, 28 person, and take whatever he's given you and make it great for God. And then third, remember that the power to do all this is not in you. It's from the very presence of God. And it's his transformational power that will cause you to do great leadership and service to mankind.